uh, welcome to our little book reading. Um, this is not my co-author, he's just about to join me, he's just switching on the camera. Hello folks, I'm, uh, I'm the co-author, uh, uh, Andrew Edwards and this is... Suzanne Edwards. And we're here to talk to you today about Ghosts of the Belle Epoque, which is the um, history of the Grand Hotel de Palme in Palermo. In one of our previous books, Sicily, A Literary Guide for Travellers, we actually included the hotel, um, but during our research we realised that there was so much more that we could say, uh, but didn't have room for in that book, um, so we decided it was a worthy protagonist having witnessed so many key events of the uh, 19th and 20th century. Exactly. Uh, before we start, um, I've got a glass of... Uh, Glass of Nero d'Avola. Um, perhaps it should be a um, a Gatto Pardo cocktail from uh, um, the barman at the Palms, Librizzi. But um, it'll help the reading. It'll help the reading. So it. we'll have a slurp, as uh, as Keith Floyd used to say. Let's start off with um, um, how it became a hotel. It was initially a palazzo, or intended to be a palazzo, for the Ingham Whitaker family. Um, a family of Anglo-Sicilian merchants, uh, very wealthy, principally for Benjamin Ingham, the uh, paterfamilias. They had uh, concerns in wine, uh, sumac, even pepper at some stage, sulphur. Um, sadly, Benjamin Ingham was never to see it as a, his own residence, um, as he, uh, he died at the age of 76, and it went down to Ben Ingham, his namesake and nephew, who basically uh, decided he didn't want to live there and sold it on to Enrico Ragusa, who was a hotelier. And Ragusa had the uh, good sense and fortune to be able to enlist the help of the architect and designer Ernesto Basile, um, who was also famous for having designed the Massimo Theatre in Palermo. Mm. He took it over from his father, who, who didn't get to finish it. That's, That's right, fine. and he yeah. very much developed it in the uh, Liberty style. Absolutely. As you can tell from the uh, the entrance to the uh, palms, that sort of scallop shape as, uh, as you go into the hotel is very much in the Liberty style. Um, Ragusa had a background in, um, in uh, working in the hotel trade and um, very much invested a lot of time and energy in making it a premier destination, in attracting the likes um, of, of poets, composers, uh, in latter days there were film stars after Ragusa's death. Um, we had all sorts of manners of goings on, generals, corrupt politicians, mm -hmm. there was even a mafiosi meeting between North and uh, North American and Sicilian Mafia about the heroin trade in the 50s that went on in the hotel. And a fair few eccentrics as well. Eccentric barons, absolutely. One baron who may or may not have been condemned to live in the hotel because he had a sort of fatwa over his head um, from the Mafia. Um, if uh, if rumour and uh, circumstances to be believed. And there were, but there were a, a lot of eccentric characters, a lot of interesting stories that actually took place in the hotel. Uh, one of the first major guests was Richard Wagner, the composer. Followed uh, close on his heels was Guy de Maupassant, the French writer who actually uh, um, was very keen in seeing Palermo and uh, discovered that uh, Wagner had stayed in the palms and Suzanne's going to read you a bit from that. Yes, as Andy said, Guy de Maupassant um, in 1885 went on a journey to Italy with some friends and he was very keen to uh, go to Sicily having heard that Wagner had visited there before him. So we find ourselves uh, with Maupassant arriving. Stepping from the boat, Maupassant was immediately struck by the bustling shops and commercial animation of the people. It was a time when those involved in economic activity still transported goods using the famous Sicilian cart, now consigned to museums and exhibitions of traditional folk life. The Frenchmen marvelled at the brightly hand-painted wagons with their crude and odd paintings representing historical facts, adventures of all kinds. If he found the carts naively attractive, he was transported to another realm by the Palantine Chapel inside the Palazzo dei Normani. 
Roger II commissioned this masterwork of Byzantine gold mosaic, Arab starwood carving and inlaid tile work in the 12th century. Maupassant's awed prose encapsulates the radiance. The calm beauty and attractiveness of this little chapel, which is positively the most wonderful masterpiece of its kind, causes one to stand entranced before these walls, shining with a soft light that dimly illuminates the whole edifice, leading one's mind into biblical and heavenly landscapes. In a state of almost meditative bliss, Maupassant leisurely made his way to the palms, where his serene state of mind leads him to pick up the story thus. I came back slowly to the Hotel of the Palms, which has one of the finest gardens in the city, the gardens of tropical countries filled with enormous and strange plants. The traveller, seated on a bench, gives me in a few words the events of the past year, and going back to the memories of bygone years, he says, among other things, this happened when Wagner lived here. Astonished at this, I said, what, here in this hotel? Why, yes, it was while here that he wrote the last notes of Parsifal and corrected the proofs. Maupassant, on further inquiry, realised that Wagner had left a strong impression of his immutability, which corresponds remarkably with Tina Scalia's account. Maupassant noted the maestro's reckless temper, insufferable arrogance and disdain for company. Nevertheless, he was most keen to go in search of the hotel room occupied by the German and swiftly sought out Ragusa, requesting that the proprietor show him Wagner's suite. Ragusa was only too happy to oblige and took him to the desired location, where Maupassant proceeded to look for an object, a chair, a table, anything that contained the essence of the man. Ragusa pointed out the couch that Wagner had requested and explained that the maestro had covered it with rugs worked in gold thread. But it took him a little while to actually find the essence of the man and quite extraordinarily he opens um, the cupboard of the wardrobe and he it's is, is hit cologne. by this scent mm. and apparently um, Wagner used to like to douse his clothes and linen with a, a rose scent and it was this rose scent that um, Maupassant was able to detect yeah. so he went away very happy. Yes, he, he found the essence of the man, which is what he was after, yeah, metaphorically and literally. There are so many stories we could pick from. I briefly mentioned the Baron who um, was supposedly banished to the hotel by the Mafia. Um, I'm going to actually read another little piece um, about another Baron um, who was actually fascinated with the story of Raymond Roussel, who was the French poet who committed uh, suicide through an overdose in the uh, hotel, or at least everybody says he did, um, although Leonardo Chache is not so sure. But anyway, um, I will actually uh, uh, carry on and read this little bit. Um, One man intrigued by the Roussel case was the eccentric Italian writer Baron Agostino Fausto La Lobbia, 1905-1978. In her book, Alla scoperta dei segreti perduti della Sicilia, In Search of Sicily's Lost uh, Secrets, Clara Saretta uh, makes the claim that Lalomia's favourite room in the palms was 224, as we know, the scene of Roussel's demise. He shared his many stays at the hotel with a pet blackbird he called Don Turidu Capra, and a cat who accompanied him everywhere, going by the equally glorious name of Sua Eccellenza Referendario Paolo Anarino. La Lomia boasted of his popularity, and as if to prove it, spent time in his hotel room writing letters to himself, which he duly took to the reception for delivery. He would subsequently return and collect the post he had penned hours earlier. The Baron was also famous for his amorous conquests not all of which were gained through his charm and individuality. It seems he would pay beautiful women to spend the night in his hotel room. One anecdote, which appeared in an article for the Italian national newspaper La Repubblica, tells of chambermaids and room service staff finding La Lomia on his knees after such a night, as if completely drained by the experience. He turned to them asking for help. 
Basically, um, he was also a member in Canicati of a uh, academy, the Academia del Parnaso, uh, which was sort of a literary uh, um, poetic society, but also um, with a slightly humorous uh, uh, connotations. And he got on the wrong side of Mussolini. Never a good idea. No. Pouring further oil on troubled waters was the decision to award Arcadian status, that's a member of the academy, to Mussolini's regional prefect, who soon worked out that his fellow members at the same level were simple peasants, and not to mention homeless wanderers. He refused to brush aside the slight and issued the academy a list of subjects that members were forbidden, absolutely forbidden, to take lightly. If La Lomia found his humour restricted politically, he was less circumspect with matters concerning death. Years later, in 1969, the Giornale di Sicilia newspaper carried a formal notice announcing the death and funeral of Sua Eccellenza Referendario Paolo Anarino. The announcement of the cat's death was made by an undoubtedly sorrowful Turidu Capra. There is no reason to think that La Lomia took his faithful pet's death lightly. It was just his way of showing respect and grief. Absurdist humour was his vehicle and defence mechanism for dealing with life. He is often famously quoted as saying that the silly things in life should be enjoyed in order to make the world one's own. He really thought that everything in this world was frivolous to a lesser or greater degree. Although um, it seems he believed true life existed only in death. His black humour was most visible when he staged his own mock funeral in 1967, which he attended with heart beating and breath in his lungs, still very much full of life. The Baron was pictured next to his tomb, which was only missing the inscription of the inevitable date to come. A suitably extravagant band played the distinctive brass music that can be heard to this day at Sicilian funerals, and he supplied all his guests with almond pastries. His excuse for the charade was the fact that one should only think about death when one was happy. Sadly, the Baron's own funeral um, was indeed not as um, joyous an occasion, and uh, far fewer people turned up than he had anticipated. The other Baron we mentioned earlier um, was carried out the front door of the Palms with full honours, rather than out through the kitchen, <laughs> as is the case in most deaths in hotels. But uh, there we are. In latter years, the, uh, the hotel um, has been on a steady, steady decline, despite uh, the, the, the heady days of La Dolce Vita in the 60s. Mm, I think you can say a yeah. kind of fading grandeur. A fading grandeur. Yeah. Um, there have been film stars, um, the likes of Richard Burton, Sofia Loren, opera divas, Maria Callas, and um, uh, the great movies you can think of that were filmed in Sicily. Uh, many of the cast visited the hotel and we include um, a, a, a good number of stories from that sort of era as well. These days the hotel is under a renovation and um, it was due to open in 2020. We're not quite sure what will happen now. Let's hope um, that the, the belle epoque charm of the establishment is kept and this wonderful history which is as much about the people as it is about the building um, can mesh together to produce something in the future.